Hi, I'm Lily Tuttle, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the latest episode of Curators from the Couch, our video series featuring important and relevant voices from our own living rooms to yours. Uh, today's episode is special for many reasons, the first of which is that I'm on site at the museum. Uh, we're in the process of organizing a new exhibition here featuring objects and images that represent and reflect all that's been happening over these past few crazy months in New York City. Um, I'll be sharing a little more information about that at the end, so stay tuned. In the meantime, it is my pleasure today to be talking about City Game, Basketball in New York, an exhibition that I curated that opened in mid-February, right before New York was put on pause. The show focuses on the legacy of basketball in New York City, uh, the excitement, the energy, the evolution of this quintessentially urban sport and what it means to New York. Over the next 30 minutes, I will be talking about the show with the design team that helped us bring it to life. Jonathan Jackson and Christopher Aljama from the contemporary design studio, We Should Do It All. Uh, Jonathan is the founding partner of We Should Do It All with over 17 years of architectural, spatial, gra and graphic design experience for global brands. Prior to founding Wizdia in 2004, he worked for the architect studio Archaea in Italy, Architectonics and Lindy Roy in New York, and he served as two years on the board of directors of the AIJ AIGA New York and has served as the visiting critic at Columbia, Rhode Island School of Design, and has lectured at the ESVMD in Switzerland um, and at the University of Michigan, Harvard Graduate School of Design, and uh, Syracuse University School of Architecture. Christopher is a New York City-based designer, architectural, experiential, and furniture, who has built environments in New York, Texas, California, and South Korea, as well as Mexico City. Uh, his studies have included a semester in the graduate architecture program at TU Graz, Austria, and a furniture design residency with Casa Gutierrez in Mexico City. His work includes clientele such as the Smithsonian, Nike, the William Vale, Google, and Dover Street Market. He's been published in the top design outlets and is also a recipient of an AIA Design Award for his role in shotgun house development and its uh, role in community outreach in the low income wards of Houston, Texas. Uh, welcome to you both. Uh, it's great to see you. Um, first, I just wanna give a little bit of background on the exhibition before we dive in and we're seeing some images here from the show. Uh, the story of basketball is a quintessential New York story created in the schoolyards on the street corners, gymnasiums and large arenas of New York City. It's a culture that cuts across race, ethnicity, class and language. From its early roots in the immigrant communities uh, to renowned celebrity players, the sport really reflects the city's cultural, social, and economic history. City Game Basketball in New York uh, celebrates this game and the diverse New Yorkers who play it and love it. It is chock full of original objects, uh, eph ephemera and photography, video, and audio. All highlight the connections between basketball, music, and fashion, which will enable visitors to relive the historic highs and lows of New York and basketball and how they shape each other. Um, so let's get to it. Um, I want to start back, we can all take ourselves back months and months, really years ago, um, when my colleague Todd Ludlam and I called you up and reached out about City Game and said, would you be interested in working with us a show, on a show about basketball in New York? Um, and it was my recollection that you were pretty excited about it. And so I would love it if you could tell our viewers what your reaction was and, and maybe why you felt that way. Yeah, I mean, uh, so I'm, I'm a huge fan of the sport. I play it. Um, you know, a, a client, a longtime client of ours is Nike, and we've done a lot of Nike basketball work. Um, so the excitement was uh, definitely um, abundant. And I think... For us, it, it, it was uh, right away, it was, it was interesting to think about a project about basketball away from the gaze of, of Nike, not through that lens, but through the lens of a museum, through the lens of New York City. Um, uh, so that was uh, an interesting challenge for me right away. And I think that that's what got, got, got my excitement going. Uh, of course, just being a fan of the sport. And anytime we work on a museum project, an exhibition, it's about learning, right? So um, just knew that there was gonna be rich content uh, to, 
really enhanced my knowledge of the game, which I'm happy to say took place. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And like, I, I remember, um, you know, for me, uh, you know, I played basketball a lot when I was younger, but for most of my like early to mid twenties, I, I kind of didn't play that often. But then uh, when I moved to New York in 2016, I immediately started like playing basketball again, uh, almost every weekend because of the culture around it in the city. Like um, there's a court pretty much on every other block. So understanding like uh, the importance of the sport to New York city and kind of really getting into the community aspect of the game here was like really exciting. And like Jonathan said, the idea to like learn a lot about the specific relationship between the city and the sport here was really exciting. Yeah. No, I mean, I think just one more thing, like Chris and I have a dialogue around the game every morning <laughs> coming into work. <laughs> like, did you watch that last night? Did you see this? Blah, blah, blah. So that's kind of like, to work on this was the absolute must. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I think that's something that we, I'd like to think that we really achieved in the exhibition is that it's like, even for people who come in and they, you know, they, they love basketball, maybe they play or they follow New York teams or, or you know the history or whatever, there's something new. There's some way you can look at it differently and see these connections and juxtapositions that I think, um, I think that's one of the, really nice things about it is that it takes a subject that many people feel like they know and really kind of brings new um, angles out yeah. about it. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about your design concept. For those of you who haven't seen the exhibition, and it's now again open to the public, so get on up here and check it out. Um, one of the key elements is a bleacher inspired design. We have here two um, different possibility, you know, sort of the elevations for what you were thinking about the floor plans. Um, can you talk a little bit about the perimeter bleacher? What inspired you? What was the intention for that design? You know, um, it's a really, you know, everyone who walks in there has this kind of a oh wow moment with it, but it's great to tell us a little bit about your process. Chris, you want to go first and I can chime in. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so basically, like when, when Jonathan and I really sat down and talked about how we wanted to approach it, um like uh I, I think we really start from like what was this feeling we were really trying to capture and i think to kind of touch a bit more on what we were talking about a second ago about why we were so excited was um you know like we're both lovers of the sport and so we think from a design standpoint what can we really bring to the table like what can we really show um that people would you know like just what can we really showcase about the sport and there's this kind of you know, almost spiritual feeling you get when you um, walk through the bleachers and you step onto the court and that feeling like kind of, you know, evoking that feeling and everyone that comes and visits the exhibition was kind of paramount. So um, that was one of the ideas about how you kind of enter into this bleacher idea. And then, you know, more generally, we also thought about giving the visitors the experience of being on the court and interacting like they're a player and then flipping the script a bit so that you have the um, content and these historical figures all sitting on bleachers, almost watching you back as you look into history. Um, so yeah, I don't know. How was that? Yeah, that's that good. I mean, uh, <laughs> the only thing I would add, it, uh, the only thing I would add to it, I remember in one of our initial meetings, uh, the director of the Museum Whitney saying like, this needs to be like super impactful, dynamic, uh, as soon as you step in the room and, you know, when we started to think about how you enter the room and making sure that these, these tunnels led you uh, into the space, um, I think that, I think, I, I hope we answered her call with that. Uh, um, you know, even the idea of the bleachers scaling up almost to the ceiling height, um, just really thinking about monumentality too. And yeah, just, a quick, mm -hmm. oh, just a quick sidebar is that, uh, I was laughing a second ago because Jonathan and I earlier, like we were doing a write up on this project and <laughs> we were like, we were uh, trying to like, we were both doing like a write up and like shared it with each other. And he was like, Chris, why don't you do like a little write up and send it over to me. And I sent him and like, I just was so bored. So I sat down and just like super long, like poetic thing. And Jonathan read it and he was like, no, we can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
he, he, he got really poetic. It was it was it was so well done, but it didn't, it didn't fit. It was like peak COVID, so I'm just like we're all like in our feelings, you know. <laughs> I asked him to write the caption for our Instagram post, and he went like super like Shakespeare, and it was like oh. <laughs> <laughs> we should all share that. Was too weird. He was like he was like no, we can't do this. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I but I think it's I think you guys really achieved it. I mean, I think for me, what I love is that you walk in and there, you know, and people we talked about this a lot and this idea of like walking down the tunnel, you know, out and then sort of the opening of the cord and you know, people talk about like the moment in 1970, Willis Reed coming out on the cord and like that just kind of that that big burst. And while our gallery isn't Madison Square Garden there is kind of that bold energy that just kind of, you know, meets you upon entry and the color and the sound and, you know, this incredible graphic where you have the court line that's carried throughout. Um, I think it's one of the really more unique projects that we've you know, I've worked on here. And, you know, the, the, the big images at the top, it's, it's really, you know, I think it's great how we're able to utilize the full height of the gallery. Um, in a way that's, you know, really true to the sport too, where you just have this kind of, you know, like really great vertical quality to the space um, and activating that top level, I think is really awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so Jonathan, your design portfolio includes work for Nike's 150,000 square foot headquarters in New York, as well as the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, DC. So um, can you tell us when you take on projects like that, uh, how, do you, how do you take that on? And also, I just wanna ask like, it's such an interesting, you know, that, I mean, this is why you were such a perfect fit for this project is like doing the Nike work and doing the Smithsonian work. Um, if you just could tell us a little bit about what these experiences have been like and any kind of connections you found. Yeah, um, I would say because the museum came before Nike uh, mm -hmm. in DC, that, <laughs> and at the time it was only three people in the studio, uh, <laughs> that was a daunting, the, the idea of taking on that, that work was daunting just because of the legacy, the history, the heritage involved. So we definitely mm -hmm. felt that pressure. But I think I'm going to refer back to what Kobe said, actually. And it's like trusting your process, trusting your practice and what you've done repeatedly over and over again. And once we got past the idea of the weight that the work has to carry, we went back and settled into ourselves. And it was, it was exactly that, trusting the process that you've always done, that you've been taught in school, that you've done on previous projects, even though they were smaller scale, the methods still apply. Um, so that's, you know, that's basically it. And then once we got past the museum, in all honesty, <laughs> it was, we felt like we can do anything. Um, uh, so that, that's kind of how, how that happened. And um, um, yeah, and I think it's, it's uh, we, as a studio, we should do it all. We've kind of created a nice little niche for ourselves where we can we can hold multiple hats where it's working for major institutions like you all or mom and pop shops. Um, I think that's something that we really pride ourselves on is to, to, to carry these different, um, these different challenges uh, with the same vigor. Um, and uh, yeah, diving into, you know, whether it be retail or real rich, deep content uh, from, a, from this, you know, from the museum, it's, um, it's, it's really about um, finding uh, the gem of the project and, and, and making sure that that concept can, can, can carry through. Um, yeah, um, I think that's kind of our approach in general. I think it's so interesting too. I mean, coming from the world of museums and like educational nonprofit, I'd love to be a fly on the wall at one of these Nike meetings where it's like all about the impact and the sizzle and like, I think their budgets are probably pretty different than ours. And that's just, um, that seems really cool to me. Like really, it would be really interesting to be in that, that That's That's, yeah, that's what's really interesting too is uh, 
with the Nike work, not to call it dumb or anything, but it's mm-hmm. we're basically like, what are the what is what do we want to get across with this shoe or whatever it may be, mm-hmm. and you know, it's it's really surface level to the for the most part, and but there's tons of money into it to back back it, and then you have a museum project where there's so much to worry about. <laughs> the story, I mean, and and the storytelling for product has to be on point too, no doubt, but. Um, when there's actually things that you can learn uh, and take away from, um, and then that doesn't have the final financial backing of a Nike, but there's so much more layers to things, uh, that dichotomy and floating in between those two worlds is, is really, really interesting. Yeah, it's a great, I think it's a great mix of projects and, and you know, the, those conversations are really interesting. Um, so Christopher, I want to turn to you now. Your current projects include a research, pro- research research book about the role of chair design in politics throughout our global history, um, and a series of furniture that uses boarded-up storefront wood from the Black Lives Matter protests and a community forward cafe in Crown Heights. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this? This sounds really interesting and creative. Oh sure, thank you. Um, I, I I guess I can just do a quick little sentence on uh each of those so the first one is um well i'll try to make it one sentence we'll see how i do uh the so the first one is essentially um it's it's come up the conversation a lot with jonathan and i both about just um how design is viewed so this project kind of came from uh really an educational standpoint um hence like the research aspect which was like how can you show how important design decisions are um in in areas that we typically don't think about design decisions so it's this book that kind of takes a few different topics and it shows you the design decisions that are behind them um and it's a book expected to come out i'd say spring 2021 and um it it includes an interview with uh bill clinton's interior designer for the white house um it's going to have a lot of uh dry infographics that'll look nice so they won't feel dry um so i'm I'm really excited about that one um the the furniture series um it's it's actually it came from uh receiving a bunch of four by eights from the tenement museum they they boarded up their storefront and uh i we kind of procured like these four by eights and um the idea is to and it, it should be done, I'd say, January 2021. Um, and the idea is to turn these boarded up wood furniture, uh, uh, boarded up wood into these a furniture series that will get. Um, first, people will have like conversations on the furniture, and then we'll um, auction off the pieces and donate the proceeds to organizations to support Black life. And then the, the final project is um, a cafe that's going to be opening in December in Crown Heights. Um, and it's, in a, it's a black owned cafe that's all about um, building up, you know, essentially the community it's within, which is on St. James Place in Crown Heights. And it's headed by a great guy, Adam Keita, um, who's formerly would say in Four Horsemen. So, um, and they have a Kickstarter and that, and I think it's funded or it's almost funded, but uh, I'm not too sure, but yeah, it's called Daughter. Um, and it will be this, I think mid-December is when it's going to be open. Wow, that's great. I mean, I think it's it's so interesting. And this is a little bit what we're trying to get at in this New York Response exhibition that we're putting together here at the museum is about kind of the creativity and, and artistic innovation that can come out of times of crisis in the city. You know, there's, I mean, there's a long history of this going back to the days of, you know, subway graffiti and hip hop. But, you know, I think we have to really kind of as designers and curators really kind of have a ear to the ground, so to speak, about, you know, some of the great work that's going around, going on in the city and, um, you know, find ways to showcase that and support it. So that's really exciting. Um, I guess along those lines, I wanted to just talk to you a little bit about, you know, the past few months and, and um, you know, not just COVID, but the protests, the mov- movement for Black Lives. Um, and I just wanted to kind of open the floor a little bit to what your thoughts are about how the NBA has responded um, and, you know, your thoughts on, you know, because we're the Museum of the City of New York, I have to ask, you know, New York teams and players um, and just your feelings about kind of the state of the game right now. 
both, I guess, in the professional arena and also, um, you know, what you've seen, if you've been in New York, you know, what's going on in our um, public outdoor courts now that people are back outside. Yeah, I mean, uh, so I was one of those maybe rare small audiences um, that didn't think the NBA should have restarted to begin with, should have mm. sort of um, uh, not changed where the attention was going. Uh, that's kind of what my thought was. Um, and, you know, I had friends like, are you going to watch? And I was like, no, I'm not going to watch. But then I ended up watching because I love the sport and I couldn't stay away from it. And I was really appreciating all the efforts the players, WNBA players, um, but I think there was a golden opportunity um, where another shooting happened, another uh, thank goodness he didn't pass away. Um, but basically another instance of police brutality and the players held a strike uh, for what I thought was gonna be much longer. Um, mm -hmm. Only ended up being, I think maybe 24 hours. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that was a golden opportunity to continue that strike. Uh, to, it gave everyone a little taste of entertainment and then to take it away, uh, to show how serious everyone was, I thought, uh, would have been far, far more powerful. Um, and I see that as a missed opportunity. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I think uh, the, the, the power that these athletes have, what they, what they can wield, um, is, is huge. And uh, yeah, I, I think that was a missed opportunity. Um, and I, I think as far as players that I admired during this time, I think there's, there's quite a few, but Kyrie stands out to me the most because he actually never committed to play, even though his team did, uh, because that's where I initially stood in the first place. But off the court, he's done so much financially, time. Um, so I, I see him, I'm a Celtic fan, and I kind of was mad at him for leaving. Uh, but I hold him in a different regard now uh, for what he's done. Um, He's, he's stand out. And I actually feel like the WNBA has been outstanding, uh, actually even more so than the NBA and how they have approached their, their, um, their processing and their activism. Um, so there's quite a few um, players in the WNBA that have done an excellent job in that. Um, and as far as like being out in New York, unfortunately I've been upstate throughout this COVID time um, uh, coming into the city, you know, periodically, but never for great lengths of periods of time. And uh, so I haven't witnessed um, uh, anything on the outdoor courts, but um, yeah, uh, that's kind of where I stood with NBA, WNBA and, and protesting in the, in the current climate of things. Uh, I was I was all for the NBA restart until the Rockets got eliminated. Yeah. <laughs> And then I feel like they should have, after that, I was like, man, Corona is a big deal. We should really, <laughs> should really quarantine. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, I, I, I hear you on Kyrie. I don't know, Christopher, about the Rockets, but sure. Um, Houston boy. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's been, I think it's been really, I think there's been a lot of really good, you know, good messages to take away in terms of the way they've handled this for sure. Yeah. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about what you guys are working on right now? Like, do you have anything uh, exciting coming up you want to share with our audience? Chris, you want to talk about Fall River? Sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so one project we're really excited about that is, uh, I think, opening in eight days, actually, or, in, or nine days, um, is uh, it's this festival in Fall River, Massachusetts called Fall River. Um, and it's entering its second year. And it's this really great like music and arts um, festival. And I think Jonathan can speak more about it, but uh, we, you know, we're providing one of the installations that will be, I guess, semi-permanent. So it's gonna um, really be showcased during this festival then it'll, it'll live on um, just in the city along this really nice river trail park. Uh, it's this, series of benches that are all about promoting uh well so okay so a little bit of background is you know we, we're seeing the discourse that's taking place and we want to 
help create environments of um, healthier discussion, like discussion rooted in at least some semblance of facts. Um, <laughs> and so, <laughs> you know, uh, regarding <laughs> last night and <laughs> what we all saw. Um, and so, and so we're, we're creating these series of benches that uh, as you as you move along the path, I'll ask you questions, um, particularly about immigration, because that's a huge um, topic in Fall River right now. And the idea is that you can kind of scan like this QR code, um, you can read about or you can help answer questions about what's going on with immigration and you can we invite you to kind of sit down on these benches and discuss or um, even if you just want to take a break from walking and sit on these benches. So we're really excited about that one and um, we're almost at the finish line. And we're excited to share that one too. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, as Chris noted is Fall River has been such a huge pipeline for the Portuguese population. And over the recently, recent years, it's become sort of a, a, a major destination for Puerto Ricans who have been hit hard by uh, hurricanes. Um, and there's been a little bit of blowback on, on why are Puerto Ricans coming here by the Portuguese. And, um, you know, it's, it, the overall project is a, a reminder that we all come from somewhere and, and um, uh, what we, I think, don't hear often enough is uh, the immigrant story um, and their take on things and what it means to be here in the U.S. We often are, are listening to these ideas of legalization, documented, undocumented, uh, but we don't often hear um, enough from the voices of, of, of the immigrants. And I think uh, what we're trying to do is uh, give, give them their opinions and leaving a platform for them to be heard, um, which is what we're really excited about. And, and then another small thing that we're working on is uh, kind of unexpected and different from a different challenge from the, for the studio that we're really excited about is also uh, we've been asked to design um, a series of rugs for Design Within Reach, uh, which is really cool. So um, yeah, just out of left field. So it's yeah, always diverse at what comes in or we try to keep it that way. That's awesome. You guys do so many interesting, cool, like diverse projects. I mean that, I wouldn't expect anything less from you than like a project, you know, an outdoor installation about immigration in Fall River and rugs for design with a <laughs> That's like, that's terrific. Um, that's yeah. We could, we could go on. There's so many things I feel like we could talk about in terms of sports and design and museums. I, 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 you know, we, this has been such a rich, um, interesting conversation. And, you know, I, I do hope that our viewers and, and people who are watching this will come on up to see the exhibition. It looks great. It looks as beautiful as it did the day it opened. Um, the bleacher design is incredible. Uh, the graphics are so, um, you know, just on point in terms of telling this basketball story. So um, really, uh, I, we should all feel incredibly proud of ourselves, I will say. Um, but that actually does bring us pretty much to the end of, um, this uh, installation. Um, I just got a question with 30 seconds. We just wanna make sure that we highlight our contributors, Bill Roden and Bobito Garcia, who worked with us on this exhibition. They have been absolutely instrumental to telling the story. I think Bill, um, as someone who has been, you know, covering professional sports, for so long, um, you know, first, first with the New York Times and now with the undefeated, he's had some really wise and thoughtful and eloquent words um, about the past few months um, and the protests um, and just kind of the role of the NBA. And then Bobito Garcia, who is, um, you know, a, a hooper and playground basketball is really his, his jam through and through. He's contributed so much content to this exhibition and taught me an incredible, incredible amount. Um, and it's just also a really thoughtful, generous person and a great New Yorker. Um, so working with them among many, many, many other scholars and contributors and artists and collectors and photographers and schools and players and the leagues, I could go on and on and on. This was like, this was, it, I mean, it, this took more than a village. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to Pink Sparrow for fabrication. Pink Sparrow. LRX <laughs> printing. I mean, 
yeah, yeah. I mean, collaboration is endless on, on these type of projects so yeah this was this was it was a real group effort and so I just I thank everyone so 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 much and for the support that we continue to get on social media um, but I've got to wrap up. So this brings us to the end of this episode of Curators from the Couch. Um, I want to thank Jonathan and Christopher for a great conversation. Um, thank you to the whole MCMI team um, that make uh, projects like this possible. Um, City Game will be up um, through April of 2021. So please, you know, put on your mask, come up to the museum. We're open. The shop is open. The cafe is open. We're here. Um, and we have a ton of great programs coming up, including a very special four-part symposium led by the New Yorkers, Vincent Cunningham. Uh, the first installation, Protest City, is this coming Wednesday, October 14th at 7.30 p.m., featuring a conversation with architect Mabel Wilson and photographer Mark Clennon. You can see the full lineup at mcny.org. It's gonna be in Incredible. Um, also coming up on October 20th, 1.30 p.m., the next Curators from the Couch will focus on voting rights in advance of the upcoming election. Deadlines to register are coming up and you can go to IWillVote.com, IWillVote.com uh, to make sure you're registered to vote and then be sure to vote on November 3rd, vote. Uh, finally, just a reminder, we're open come visit, come grab a time ticket and learn all about our safety protocols and what's on view on our website and social mcny.org. While you're there, if you feel like it, make a donation, we'd be really glad. Um, thank you so much, Jennifer, Jonathan and Christopher, Jennifer, Jonathan and Christopher. <laughs> That's easier. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Um, That's so good to see you. my day, you guys, it really did. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Thank you so right. much. We're, Take we're, care. Yeah. All right. Be Bye. well. Bye. Bye.